This is Regin's Travels Podcast. All right, hello everyone. Welcome to another episode of Regin's Travels Podcast. Today we have a very special guest. Joining us is Neil Mant. He is a producer, director, actor, and tech entrepreneur. He has directed and produced a lot of movies such as The Million Dollar Kid and Disney's Million Dollar Arm. He is the leading actor, director, and one of the producers of one of my favorite travel movies, Last Stop for Paul. Two weeks around the world. My buddy Paul Conkle has died. I want to take his ashes with us on the trip, sprinkle them around the world. What the hell is that? It's my buddy Paul, remember? You can't carry that thing around the world. All right, hang on a second. Here you go. Come on. Our goal, to visit as many countries as possible in two weeks. Our means, a couple of around the world tickets, and a few scams along the way. I got it all worked out. All the hotels are gonna be free. All Miss Mary from Frommers. We're actually going around the world scamming hotels for free places to stay. Brilliant. Hello, Neil. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks for being here. Hey, Regin. Thanks for having me. Yeah. How are you doing right now there in Los Angeles? You know what? We're in the middle of a little warm spell in November. Uh, so it's great. It's 80 something degrees. And where I grew up in Detroit, it's very, very cold. So I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. One of my favorite travel movies, Last Stop for Paul. It's an amazing movie. It's one of the movies that inspired me to travel a lot. In fact, to do a round the world trip. I remember ever since I've watched that movie, I, I always dream of having an, an around the world trip. So how did you come up with an awesome travel movie? Well, I, I felt the same as you. You know, I wanted to have an around the world trip for many years. I love the idea. And you hear about people who say, well, I'm going to go to the airport and I'm just going to look up on the board and just pick someplace and go. And I, I kind of had that always in my mind that that would be something really special to do. And, and then I realized, you know, why would I just go on to one place at random? Why don't I go to a bunch of places? And I had heard about the round the world ticket for many years. And so I said, let me just look into it. And it's pretty simple to get. You just call any airline and you ask to speak to the round the world ticket desk. They have a specific office that does that. And you can just, as long as you go in the same direction, depending upon the rules, you can go on limited stops. You can go 10 stops. Um, you can do it for up to a year. And so I just decided one day I was going to do it. And Having already been a traveler, I'd been to uh, Europe many times and I had been to Asia and Australia and uh, even Africa. And so I, um, I, I, I thought to myself, well, there's a lot of places I want to go. Um, and I had these sort of unique stories already from where I'd been before. You know, I have, you know, I, I travel a lot alone. And when you travel alone, weird stuff happens to you. It just does. And <laughs> I had all these like great, like five minute cocktail stories I could have that would just blow people's minds. And being in the production world, I thought, wow, you know, if only I could figure a way to make this into something, you know, a movie somehow. But they were, you know, they, they didn't have a purpose. They were just random stories from random places. And that's when I thought of what if we had these two guys traveling around the world, sprinkling the ashes of their dead buddy as they were looking to go to this full moon party in Thailand. And, and when I went on that first around the world trip with a, a friend of mine, um, I brought a camera and I shot a couple of those sequences. I shot the one in Russia and I shot the one in Egypt. And, uh, and then I brought it back and I looked at these things and I said, you know what, I could do it and I'd have to do it on an around the world ticket. And then I could make it efficient and I just go place to place and shoot the little scenes and have this through line. And so that's how I got my first around the world ticket and how I was inspired to make Last Stop for Paul. Wow. It's really amazing. Especially as during the time travel vlogging is not yet very common, right? Like nowadays people will just travel and have their camera and produce kind of like this mini travel movie clips, post them on YouTube. But during the time, that's, that's not yet very common, and yet you're able to to think about this stuff. Well, I, I think Last Stop for Paul was the first movie of its kind where this was yeah. done. I'm sure other people have done it as documentaries, but I don't know that anyone else has done it as a narrative. I haven't heard of it, um, which I think is kind of strange. 
uh, given that, like if I was doing Last Stop for Paul again, I'd do it on an iPhone right now. And nobody would question me shooting in random places um, with an iPhone. And you could have a little wireless mic and it totally steal all the shots. That was one of the magic of the pieces of the movie. It's like you have these big scenes and real environments and all these extras that are regular people. And all the scenes are just stolen. I never asked any for permission. I just came in and just shot. So when you were filming those scenes, right? So a lot of them are just random. It's not like stage. And then you, you mentioned you made another round the world trip. So you had like twice, you had two trips. First is the one that you just randomly took. And second one was like, okay, we're going to make a movie now. So did you have like two round the world trips then? Yeah, that's right. So actually there were, there were three. So I, um, I did the initial one in March of 2004. No, no, no. Yeah, maybe it was March of 2004, maybe 2003, I don't remember. And then I cut it together and I went to Travel Channel and I showed it to them. And I said, let's do three stories per half hour. They don't have to be connected. And we make a TV series out of it. And they loved it. And they said, 100%. And they bought 18 episodes. And as we were getting closer to making the series, they started sort of you know, well, what if we did this? And what if we did that? And one of the things they wanted to do was have a photograph of the person whose story we had collected to tell the story. And they needed every single thing in the story to be accurate. And I said, you know, some of these stories are an amalgamation of pieces. You know, they're scripted. They're not meant to be reality. And, and I was very concerned that um, the show wouldn't be what I wanted. And so we had done a pilot for them and I went, I went back to them and I bought the pilot back. I said, you know, I just, I don't think this is like <laughs> it. I mean, who does that? Who gets 18 episodes of television and says, no, thanks. Here's your money back. Um, so we did the pilot in the fall of 2004. And the only scene I think that survived that pilot in the movie was the scene in England with um, the girl, Heather Patron, who, Eventually, she becomes the through line girl. We see her in, I meet her in Greece in the flashback in England, was shot in the pilot. And then she shows back up in, in Thailand. And um, and the rest of the pilot, you know, didn't make it into the TV show. And so then we shot the movie in May and June of 2005. So there were really three separate trips involved. So what was the inspiration of the story of this movie? Because I've read somewhere on the internet before. I'm not, I'm, I don't know if it is true that it is based on a true story. Well, all of the individual stories are true. The through line of the trip to Thailand is a, is a made up story. That's the only connective tissue that would connect these stories. So each one of those little stories, they have a backstory either to me or to somebody else. So for example, in, in, uh, Chile, where you have the two Irish guys we met, and they end up with that <laughs> van named Stacy. Yeah. I met those two guys at when I was buying a suit in uh, in Koh Samui, Thailand, and we were just chatting. And I was like, "Hey, I'm working on this project, you know, and do you have any funny stories?" And they told me that story about going skiing at the van and the brakes went out. And I was like, "That's a great story." I'd like to put you in my movie and shoot the story. I'm shooting the movie a couple of months. And they were like, yeah, right, whatever. And then a few months later, I said, hey, I'm sending you a ticket. I'll meet you in Chile. And now those guys are, you know, almost 20 years we've been friends. And so, you know, that's how that story happened. The other individual stories, you have to go case by case to find out the real backstory. But I would say a majority of them are based on things that had happened to me. Wow, it's really amazing because that scene... Uh... For me, that's like one of the funniest scenes in that movie, that scene in Chile, especially when the breaks went off. That was really funny. And you were throwing the ashes and you were saying a prayer. <laughs> that, that, that was really funny. So, so, wow, that's really amazing. But then before traveling was not yet very common, right? I think during that time, but nowadays it's, it's becoming more common because of the internet. So what was really the start, like the beginning of your, your love for travel? Because especially you've mentioned in the film that traveling made you a better person and you've kind of promoted traveling to a lot of people. So what, what was the start of your, your passion for travel? It definitely started as a kid. Um, when I was uh, young, I was traveling from Detroit back to New York 
often. Um, and so I felt very comfortable with travel. When I was uh, 10, I, they were making a movie by my house in Michigan. And I walked down to the set and I started demanding to talk with the producer. And they're like, who the hell is this little kid yelling at everybody? And, and that producer then introduced, introduced me a casting director and I started acting in commercials. And the following year we were in New York city visiting family and I ended up getting an agent there. And after a couple of trips back and forth, auditioning for some commercials with some success, my mother's, you know, who was taking me on a, it was a discount flyer at the time, New York air, kind of like Southwest. Uh, she was like, I can't do this anymore. I got three other kids. Just don't talk to anybody. And so for two and a half years from 11 to 13, I was commuting to New York city alone. I would wow. fly into Newark, New Jersey, take the bus to Port Authority and then go into the city and then audition and then come back or stay with my grandmother. And so that made me very comfortable with traveling. And then when I was 15, I was a solid D student in Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I heard about a, a class trip. Well, actually, let me tell you how this happened. This is great. This is really how I got into international travel. It was for a suntan. So... I, again, I grew up in Michigan. It was freezing cold in the winter. And at spring break, we had two weeks off. And uh, my friends and their families would often go to like Florida or Mexico for the holiday. And they would come back all tan. And meanwhile, I was in this very wintry white and I was so pale. And so my freshman year in high school, I come back from that spring break and, uh, and, you know, it's just like, you're, you're very self-conscious. You're trying to meet girls and all these other people like super tan. And I was like, ugh, I can't, ugh, it's terrible. Like my, my parents aren't taking me anywhere. And so for a long time, I was thinking about how do I correct that in my sophomore year? I do not want to be that, that, uh, uh, that white, 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 pale kid after spring break. <laughs> And I was dating a girl in the fall coming up towards that spring break pretty quickly. And I was telling her, I was like, I don't have a solution. I can get the, I can get a tan. And she said, well, the previous year she had gone to Europe with the school trip. They went to France and Spain and they ended up on the Southern coast of Spain for a couple of days. And it was warm and they were laying out on the beach. And I said, aha. So I, I, told my parents, I said, look, there's a school trip to Spain. It wasn't that expensive. And, you know, this would really help my Spanish. And my parents, for whatever reason, they bought into it. And, and soon enough, I was on a plane to Spain on this class trip. It was nine days. And it was eye-opening. Uh, I had never seen that kind of culture. Um, it just looked different. It felt different in every way. From my very, very basic, you know, U.S. suburban living. And I just was blown away. And, and you know, I felt like a like an adult. You know, the world I grew up in, people talked to you like you were a kid as a teenager. You know, just there was really no preparation for adulthood as a teenager. It's like, you're a kid, you're a kid, you're a kid, move out. It was very strange. And um, the people in Spain talked to teenagers as adults. It was just a very different kind of culture. And so I, I, I was just so excited about that. And, and I had never known what to expect. And so the minute I came back, all I could do was count the days until the next year when I could go on that spring break trip. And, mm. and I just, I had made some friends there and pen pals and I was just, just mesmerized. And so the following year it was France and Spain. And now I saw Paris and I saw the Loire Valley and, and again, Spain again. And I said, wow, I, I got to do this. So the minute that trip ended, I, all I could do was count the days until the next summer because I was going to graduate high school. And the night of my graduation, I had saved every penny I could get. And I got on a plane and I went to Europe and I backpacked it alone for three months. And, and I had, it was no credit card back then, no phone. I had $1,500 which was going to allow me to live on $23 a day. And I flew into England and I burned 300 bucks in, in like four days. And so I was extremely poor and I was sleeping in trains mostly as my shelter at night or out on the street. Uh, but man, oh man, I had the best time. And then that began my lifelong love of travel. 
So this was after graduation in high school or college? High school. I was you 17 were... when I went. Oh, wow. Yeah. So how, how were you able to make money when you were still a sophomore student in high school? Babysitting. I used to drive mm -hmm. these kids home from school every day, and then I would sit with them. And I will tell you now, oh, those, kids wow. were, those, those kids were jerks. <laughs> they, were, <laughs> they were spoiled, rotten, and they were jerks. And I had to just suck it up for my ten dollars a day or whatever it was for you know oh wow seven or eight months was was the scene in moscow happening during that backpacking trip that was from the first trip oh oh so where did it oh. exist okay so the scene in in moscow so for the people yeah, red square it, yeah for the people who don't have don't know the story so my character is in moscow and he uh is walking to red square and he gets approached by this young guy who's a guide a wannabe guide an english wannabe guide and he starts sort of touring me around and then out of nowhere he just starts urinating in the middle of the square and is rapping and then the police arrest me and then i escape from the police it's his whole to do and the real story behind that was the original backpacking trip trip i was in munich and i was in the huffborough house I had a buddy of mine who had studied German in high school. And he just said, when you go to Germany, you got to go to Munich and you got to go to the Huffer house and have a big beer. And I get to the Huffer house and it was like six bucks for beer, which is my whole budget for the day at that time. And I have my one beer and now I can't eat for the day because that was all my money. And as I walk out of the Huffer house, there's a crowd of people and they're in a big circle and they, it just opens up. And right in the middle of the circle is this, woman who's like a homeless person or you know disturbed in other ways as well and um and she is bent over in the middle of this circle urinating and and yelling in german and it was so odd uh and then as she finishes her business she just pulls up her pants and walks away and the crowd disperses and I, I couldn't even comprehend what had just happened to me what i had seen and and again this is a random story like how is this in a movie and then um i was in the train station a couple of days later going on to belgium and i had met this girl in the hostel and we were traveling together then and um and it's you know super crowded train station and i see the, the lady walked by and I said, I just told her the story and she's walking with a little person and she was giant. She was six, five, I mean, a giant. And they were drinking this big sort of wicker basket jug of wine. And I just pointed, I said, that's, that's the woman. And within minutes, there was another screaming happening, big crowd of people. And I thought, Oh my God, she's doing it again. And so I said to my friend, I said, Look, come over here. And we go and there's a crowd and we sort of muscle our way in the middle of the crowd and she's gone. But the little person is laying on the ground with a knife in his face. Oh, and the wine and the wine is gone. You can't write this stuff. That's crazy. And so when I was in Russia, I used that location as an opportunity to shoot the scene. And in a situation with the travel channel, that would not have been accepted. They would have required me to go to Germany and be right outside of the Hupper house and reshoot that scene. Right. And so, right. And, and in Russia, we shot it over two sequences. We just had a guy squirting a water bottle, but we did those okay. over two separate days. We shot the, the, the shot behind him squirting the water bottle. And then we just left. And the next day we came back and we did the scene because I didn't want to, it look like we were shooting a big scene there, you know, with this yeah, hoarding of the water bottle. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah. And one of the craziest scenes there as well was the, the opening scene where you were telling a story about Egypt, about the pyramids. That right. was that was crazy. That's amazing. <laughs> it's and, one of those that, unforgettable moments. That story happened on the first trip as well. So those are the two scenes we shot on the first trip. And the girl in that was my travel companion, Lilo Zuckerman, oh. who's a big time, big time TV writer now. Big time. Big time. Wow. Yeah. So um, among the countries that was that, that were featured in that movie, what, what was your favorite like, destination? Well, Thailand is the best. I love Thailand. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I talk about Japan and how wacky Japan is. 
I'm enamored with Japan. It's just so different, so unique. And the people are, I just, I love those people. They're so nice. And I love the culture. Um, I mean, every country is special to me, but if I had to choose a place to go over and over again, it would be um, Japan and, uh, and Thailand, which I have been to many, many times. Yeah, I remember seeing that when I was when I watched that movie, I haven't been to Japan yet. And that's one of the scenes that really fascinated me, especially when you mentioned about this, your experience in oh, the your friends experience in Japan regarding the motorcycle and all that stuff. So I was really fascinated with Japan. And then a few years forward, then I was able to travel to Japan and I was really able to really witness what you were talking about in the movie. Like it's really amazing. It's really hard to explain how different Japan is, but in a good way. Yeah, I don't think you can de you can describe Japan to people. I think the only way you can understand it is yeah. to go. Yeah, exactly. I, I try to explain to my friends sometimes when they ask me what my favorite country is because Japan is my favorite destination. But it's really hard to explain like those small experiences, those wow moments in Japan. Yeah, I, I feel like you know everywhere else you can kind of get. You know, like India is also one of my favorite places and it's just because it's crazy. Like the crazier, I, I love it. Uh, like Bangladesh, I love it. But you can you can grasp these things. You can see that and you know that it's nuts and you, you understand the poverty and, and, you know, how sad it can be, but also how exciting it can be. Um, you know, India, we had made a movie there called Million Dollar Arm for Disney. Uh, a true story about these young guys who were being scouted from India, kids to be pitchers in the major leagues. And they ultimately got signed by the Pirates. And my brother and I developed the script for that, the storyline. Um, but people can understand that. But Japan is so experiential. You have to go there to get it. So what are what are the biggest lessons you've learned in traveling the world? Well, there's a, a certain humility that you get out of it. Um, I mean, at this point, I've been to 120 countries. And... I, I kind of, at rare uh, occasions, I'll just think about it. And I'll, if I'm in a restaurant or if I'm anywhere, I look around and I know I'm the most traveled guy in the room with very rare exceptions, unless I'm an extreme travel club or something. But there's something that comes with that understanding. Like I know what a beer costs in all these countries. I understand, you know, commerce. I understand their culture. I understand how they view us. Um, and so like Sierra Leone is not just a random thing on the map. I've been there. I get it. You know, I, I, I know the differences in Africa from Morocco to Egypt, to Mozambique, to Swaziland, to South Africa, to Lesotho, to Liberia. Um, and the same thing within Asia. I understand the difference between Japan, Philippines, Thailand, and Malaysia and, and, and China, very different, all these places. And so it, there's, there's nothing tangible that I can really tell you out of it, except I understand. And I understand how, how little I am in the world. And I understand how much more there is to learn. But, you know, the sort of the core, core beginning of it was from my father. My father was an avid reader, a serious intellectual. And he would read about places and moments in time and history, loved history. And, but he'd never been anywhere. And so I thought, you know, I'm going to go to those places. I'm not going to just read about them and talk about them. I'm going to go. And so, you know, he had passed many years ago. But I think about the conversations I could have with him and sort of give color to what he read. <laughs> and so it's just the word understanding. You know, I'm sure you feel that, right? When you went around, you understand places more. What did you get? Yeah, out? for sure. What was your takeaway and understanding from the places you went to? I mean, how, how different, what did you learn? Yeah, I think one of the biggest lessons I've learned in traveling is similar to yours, the understanding, particularly the, the fact that what we hear on the news or on the media is sometimes not really accurate because what we hear on the news or on the, on the television is that's just a depiction of a certain part of a country. And what we think sometimes because of that is it's happening to the whole country. So I've experienced it a lot of times. They would say that this country is dangerous. You shouldn't go to this country because of, you know, this, these things might happen to you or this, this, this event is happening in that country. So better avoid that country. But when I actually go to that country, it's like so different from what my initial portrayal of that country is. So I think it's one of the biggest lessons. It's like 
I wouldn't take immediately what I hear on the news regarding a country because it's so different when we actually experience it there. Um, a, a classic example of this is China. China nowadays has a lot of a bad reputation around the world, even before the pandemic. But then I actually went to China and lived there, and I found that it's it's not really what people think. Yeah, China is is so diverse. It's it's so diverse. It's, it's crazy, and the differences between the cities is dramatic. Uh, you know, Beijing to Shanghai to Shenzhen to Chongqing. I mean, Chongqing is the largest city in the world, and I mean buildings everywhere buildings like you've just never seen a skyline like this you can't even imagine it. it's like 34 million people that live there and that that just was insane i couldn't even believe it and they have very different foods everywhere um yeah i mean china's like the united states you know it's like how different is miami from seattle new orleans from new york you know, very diverse, very different. And when I traveled around the world, a lot of my friends and a lot of people were messaging me because they want to do it as well. Because uh, I think they they were really amazed because they thought that it's quite impossible or, or very difficult to do, you know, when just the phrase around the world, right? It's like, it's, it's out of reach. But then I was able to do it and a lot of people were messaging me about it, about my trip. So for you, what do you think are the, the biggest myths in around the world trip? Well, I think it's really just kind of like a pie in the sky idea for most people. I don't think they think about how simple it is. Um, if you decide to travel, you know, if you're going to three different stops and you make your way you know, to a different continent, keep going. It's, the price isn't that different when you, you're going to keep moving. Um, but, you know, you talk about people reaching out to you during your travels. You know, it seems to me... Again, first of all, was last stop for Paul where you got the idea to do an around the world ticket? Yes, yes, exactly. So, you know, we started communicating over a decade ago after you saw the movie and you talked about it for years. You'd email me and you'd say, I want to go and talk about your dreams about it. And then you made it happen and you went and not only did you go, but it seems like it's been a whole change in who you are as a person. You know, you, you started making all this content and now you're talking about it continuously. And so... This has changed your underlying DNA. Am I right about that? Yes, exactly. That's incredible. And, yeah, and for no. me to be here talking to you and you tell me that this affected you like that is, you know, it's, it's very humbling to me. And I think that's the component about travel. That, and my story is that I always hoped would impact people. You know, I, I couldn't explain it. So I wanted to make a little video that I could just hand to someone and say, this is it. This is what you can do. And this is what's going to happen to you if you go alone. I mean, like, it ain't going to happen. And so the fact that, you know, you and I are talking and have been talking over this, all these years, you know, <laughs> it's crazy. After watching the movie, I can't get it out of my head. I was re always dreaming of doing that kind of trip because it, it, it's really, it looks really adventurous, you know. It was always in my head, but a lot of delays, you know, like a lot of fear, like what if. Because I, I quit my job uh, to do a round-the-world trip, and I didn't regret it. But during that time, a lot of a lot of delays because of, you know, it's especially in our culture, you know, in the Filipino culture, we don't have a culture of travel. But then when I watched the movie, the, the inspiration was really huge. It was you know, the, the sense of adventure and I want to do it while I was young, like sim similar to how you did it with your friend. So, so that's really inspired me a lot. And, and to, to be talking to you right now, the, the actor of the movie is just un unbelievable. I'm excited to talk to you. The fact that, you know, my little, little tiny movie, you know, inspired you and you now see the world differently. I mean, just, just that one thing made it worth it. And I'm, I'm fortunate that it sounds to me like you know, from some emails I've gotten from people, multiple people, it, it inspired them to travel. And I've heard of a couple of people quitting their jobs to do it, which is <laughs> exciting and, and insane. Wow, it's really amazing. Thank you so much for your time today. And any final message to our listeners out, out there who want to travel as well, but are still scared or still has this hesitation? Uh, I, I met a girl one time who I was on a plane in, in Africa and she was going home. I was flying from, um, where was I going? She, she was going to spend a couple of days in Zanzibar. It's a small island off the coast of Tanzania. And we were going over there and the plane had four people on it. My friend Lola and two people and this girl. And um, 
And, and she was telling me, and she was beautiful, young, blonde girl from Sweden. And she said that she had traveled by foot but, and by hitchhiking. No plane, no paid trains, no paid travel, no nothing from the northern part of Africa to South Africa. Nothing happened to her. And so don't be afraid. You know, stuff can happen in your own town. But go out there, be open, talk to people. They will be excited to meet you. And it will change your life. It always does. Yeah, I really love the quote in the movie when you said that you became a better person because of your travels. And that really stick with me. That's why I, I really invested in travel and I didn't regret it. No, I am. I'm a completely different person. And I'm, I'm more empathetic. Remember, when I'm in that room and I can think about all these different countries, I can place myself in other cultures. And when I meet people, you know, I get in a taxi anywhere. This is the foreign guy in the car. I'm like, where are you from? And then I can have a conversation with that person. I've been there. I've been to Bangladesh two times. You know how many people are getting in a taxi that have been to Bangladesh two times? Nobody. <laughs> that guy's never yeah. talking to anybody. And so then we can have a conversation about his culture and his world and where he grew up. And boy, boy does that make somebody stay. And then I can learn some more from them because we have a, a sort of a base. And so, I, you know, it's, it's endless the ways it affects me as a person. All right. Thank you so much for your time, Neil. It's a pleasure. And before we leave, I'm going to read this travel quote. We travel initially to lose ourselves and we travel next to find ourselves from Pico Iyer. Thank you guys for tuning in. This has been your host, Regin. Till the next episode. Mm -hmm.